Okay, we're live. Okay, hi, my name is Lauren. This is Emily, Jasmine, and Brooke, and we are doing compensation. Okay, so the purpose of compensation is to attract, motivate, and retain employees, and um, employees will feel motivated to achieve company goals if they are properly compensated. Compensation includes monetary and non-monetary forms. So a monetary compensation is something like a wage, a salary, or a bonus. And non-monetary or indirect compensation includes things like health care, insurance, uh, vacation time, and company paid training. So some other types of comp compensation include base pay, which is the basic amount that an employer agrees to pay an employee. And variable earnings are things like um, like you earn money based on your performance, and they include merit-based pay incentive incentives, bonuses, and paid time. And others include considerations, which are supplemental wages paid in addition to regular wages, and equity compensation, which is when you pay employees with company shares instead of or in addition to a regular wage. Um, there are also voluntary benefits, which include benefits given to employees that are not legally required. So that's something like vacation time or company cars or paid education. And there are mandatory benefits, which are legally required benefits that employees must receive, like Social Security, Medicare, and yeah. And yeah, okay. And so discussing the compensation package is important because it clearly defines uh, what the employee is getting, and you should develop a compensation philosophy that incorporates the company culture into the pay structure so that employees feel motivated and satisfied with their uh, compensation. And the benefits to doing this for the employer are that there's less turnover, lower absenteeism, and then for the employee, there's peace of mind because, for example, if they get sick, they'll know that they have health insurance and can go to the doctor. So to do this, you need there are steps that you need to take. So the first one is you should talk early and often. Um, you should just have a conversation that is basically is telling them what they can expect if they do a good job in terms of bonuses. And you should also ask them what they would want for a bonus. And you should have check-ins. Uh, you should also do performance evaluation separately. So you shouldn't talk about money if you're just evaluating their job. You should only talk about how they're doing. And if you are talking about uh, giving somebody a bonus or a raise, you should involve other people at the company. So you should, um, you can avoid bias by doing that by having multiple people. Um, you should also prepare for the conversation ahead of time because you're representing your company, so you want to do it well. So you want to make sure you know what you're going to say. And you need to communicate their values. So instead of just telling them a number, if they're getting a raise, you should tell them why they're getting that raise and what they did well so they continue to do it. Uh, you should also pr provide context, so if you are giving them a raise, you should compare it to how the overall company is doing so they can see where they're at. And you should be ready for a reaction, uh, whether it's positive or negative. Um, if it is negative, you should understand, hear what they're saying, but make sure they understand why you came to the decision you did. Um, and so, um, in order to attract employees and motivate them, uh, you need to have, there are two, well, there are two separate you have to have a good compensation plan, and there are two separate uh, things to evaluate, which are um, the job description and job evaluation. Um, and then for ethics, um, compensation is obviously tied into that because you want to make sure all of your employees are fairly compensated. And there have been there's been a lot of uh, drama recently about. CEO is making a lot of money, so you want to make sure that all employees are fairly compensated, whether they're the CEO or just a lower employee. Um, so like I said, compensation has a great effect on job satisfaction, so you have to c carefully evaluate the wages of not only the CEOs, but all employees, so that pay is deemed fair and ethical. And new and new, so uh, I worked for a company called MRI, 
which is a recruiting company, and so they go out and try to place people in jobs, and compensation is obviously a big factor in that because um, employees aren't most likely aren't going to leave a job that they have if the compensation isn't either better or um, fair. So when selecting employees, that was something that the recruiters had to really pay attention to to make sure that the comp uh, compensation was uh, competitive. And then also, um, I don't have a lot of a pro professional experience, but even when, as a graduate, I'm going to be looking for a job and compensation is obviously going to be a big part of that as I enter the workforce and as a human resources major, I'm going to get a job in HR and so I will be de dealing with compensation regardless. Um, and just as a summary, like I said, it's important to consider all aspects of the job when you're making compensation uh, plans and make sure that they're ethical. Um, but there are a lot of other things that go into it um, and you have to make sure that they comply with all existing uh, legislation which Emily will talk more about. Emily, is that on pause? Yes. Okay, give me a second. I'm having some technical difficulties. It's flashing red. If that helps. I know, but it's not giving me the preview up here. Um, are you familiar with, can you just look and see if it has now a video player that's counting forward on the front LED screen? Yes. And it's counting forward. Yes. So that'll be a nice profile of yourself. Oh. <laughs> so exciting. No, this is my exactly what I want to see. Alright. Sounds good. So hi everyone, I'm Emily. I'm gonna be talking about FLSA, OSHA, and some regulation. So FLSA or the Fair Labor Standard Act is a federal labor law of general and nationwide application, which includes overtime, minimum wages. Child Labor Protections and the Equal Pay Act. And um, so the overtime rule determines whether employees are eligible or exempt for overtime pay, which we'll also get into in further slides. So overtime claims. Um, some overtime claims are um, if you're miscalculating uh, your overtime, if you're not calculating for the off-the-time work that someone's doing, like this guy, he's obviously working past his normal work hours, drinking coffee, staying up late trying to finish something. So this is the new overtime rule. Uh, they changed it, so now if you're making um, 9.13 a week and you're not making that much, they need to pay you overtime to be able to meet that requirement. So this was supposed to take effect in December 1st, but currently it's on hold uh, and federal judges are reviewing it to make sure it's like A-OK. -okay. So exempt and non-exempt, most work workers are either classified as exempt or non-exempt exempt depending on the salary and type of work they do. So, alright, so exempt employees, they're paid for the work that they do, not the hours they work. So, it, it's just them being there. You're not eligible for overtime pay and uh, for more than 40 hours a week. So these are like the executives, the professional um, employees, like uh, the people working on the computers, all the, the vice president and whatnot. And then non-exempt, um, they are entitled to overtime pay. Uh, they get paid time and a half for everything over 40 hours. And um, if you're making less than 455 a week, you're most likely non-exempt. All right, so OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Congress created OSHA for a safe and healthful work environment and is to ensure these by um, providing training and education to the workforce. Um, so it deals with falls, slips, any kind of injury that happens at work, hopefully not. So, <laughs> found this picture. So this is an example of something safe. They got, you know, they have uh, uniforms, uh, there's training provided, and then this guy obviously wasn't paying attention or the you know workers didn't or the employers didn't provide anything. So normally what you're supposed to do is have a booklet of all the um, the hazardous material in there and what to do if something happens. So OSHA in the workplace, I'm gonna be going over a few of the forms that you need to fill out if someone gets injured on the job, which is super easy once you do it like a thousand times. 
So the first one uh, is going to be the 300 form. So over here, you're going to put the case number. At my work, we use the worker's claim number. You're going to put the employee's name, um, what type of job they do, the date they were injured, where the event occurred. So if it was at the loading dock or like in a lo certain location, you want to put that. Then you're going to describe it. You really need to describe like, so like this example is severe burns. So severe burns where? On the right hand, the head, the foot, you need to really describe where it's going. So over here, um, up here you're going to write where it was, the city and the state. If there was a death, hopefully not. Days away from work, uh, if they had to transfer the job because of what happened. And then over here, so in this column, this is all big one column. I apologize for splitting it up. So you only get to pick one of these options for the employee. So normally, like I work at the zoo, everything's an injury. Nothing is, we don't have, I mean, I've never seen any of these issues at the zoo. Um, but you're going to check the injury, and then you're going to finish that form. The next form you're going to fill out is the 301. So again, you're going to put the uh, work employee's name, where they live, their date of birth, when they were hired, if they're male or female. And then this part right here is um, what workers' comp like area you're going to. So if you're going to like a physical therapist, you're going to put that information there. This is the second part of that first form, the 301. You're going to put the workers' claim number the date they were injured, when they began work, and when the event actually occurred that they were injured. And then in here, got to be specific again. What they were doing for the in injury uh, was looking at these forms before this hazardous thing fell on me. And I'm going to keep going through with that. And then, um, so this you only submit yearly. Um, so it would be for 2016 or 2015, you'll be submitting it. And it's the work-related injuries. And you're going to take the total percentage of each injury that happens and the number of days they were gone, and then the type of illnesses. So hopefully you don't have a lot of those to fill out. So record keeping, um, if you have at least 10 employees, you have to keep records for the serious injuries. If it was a minor injury that didn't require first aid, you don't have to record it. Like I said, only serious ones. So they have to be kept for at least five years, and then the yearly um, ones are submitted from April to February to April. So records. I, so like I said, I work at the zoo. We keep it in a locked cabinet and then a locked door that HR only has um, the key for. So you want to make sure there's at least one lock. If you have two, even better. So I see a few faces from my class last semester when we did this. I got the job at the zoo. Um, I've been working with them. I've been doing a lot of different things. Um, they've started me with, uh, like, I sat in in a few interviews. We do a lot of phone screening through the interviews to see like which candidate is good, which one's not. Um, and the interviews are fun to sit on so you get to see like what they're actually doing, what they're looking for, because we're trying to fill like a bajillion positions right now. And um, I've also been helping them with like posting the jobs online, which is really cool. So I don't know. I think it's interesting. There's so many jobs that they want interns for, or full time, or seasonal. And then I also help them with events. Um, one of the past events that I had to work really hard for was the booth the zoo at uh, the Philadelphia Zoo. And that was really cool, so I got to um, do like the Google form and reach out to different groups who wanted to um, volunteer for it. That's really fun. And then resume screening, so that's always interesting. You get to see who was actually meant for the job and not. So, I'm going to pass it. Say again. Question. Yes. No. I'm not a gunner sergeant. That's in the Marines. I'm just Completely wrong from the Army. I'm just making all of it up. So. <laughs> okay, my question was, yes. if somebody falls into the lion pit and gets eaten, <laughs> That's and then they really bad. kill the lion, <laughs> is that two incidences or just one? <laughs> Well, I mean, it does the lions, the injury? The I don't lions? know. We haven't had anyone be eaten by a lion at Philadelphia Zoo, so I really don't know. Okay, but you'll get back to me. I will. You know what? I go to work tomorrow. I'll, I'll ask the HR there. I'm sure they'll be really thrilled by this question. Yeah, super fun. So my name is Jasmine, and I'm going to be talking about the different environmental factors that affect compensation. Okay. 
So compensation within any organization, um, as my group members previously mentioned, is vital to obtaining and keeping quality employees within the organization. 